Hi everyone, I'm Karishma. I'm a sports scientist. And as a sports scientist, I get invited to a lot of parties so people can ask me this question. And I get asked this a lot. And I just wanted to go through this with you because this is kind of the essence of what we do as sports scientists. Um, well, if someone would ask me this question, a lot of parents come to me with kids and they're like, my kid is seven years old, I need them to become a pro athlete, you have the school title, tell me how to do it. My answer to them at a party would be exactly this. Well, we have this idea that if we want to specialize in a certain sport, which is we start, as soon as we give birth to the child, we put them into that sport, we allow them to kind of keep practicing, keep practicing so they get good at it. But science tells us otherwise. What science is actually telling us that that is going to cause a larger problem later on because what's going to happen, apart from the child getting really bored of playing the sport its entire life, you will have an increased probability of burnout. Athletes will quit when they're older. More typically, when they start really young, they tend to leave the sport at an, an, an earlier age. Um, there's an ov the overuse injury, right? So if I start cricket um, when I'm five and I'm playing cricket my entire life, by the time I reach 30, the same movements that I'm using to play the sport will be overused. So that body part of mine is wearing out. Children need to develop first as athletes. They need to develop a physical ability first and then they're able to specialize in sport. So look, sports ultimately is something that human beings have created and defined. Okay, if I do this movement, then it's called cricket. And if I do this movement, then it's called football. And if I do this movement, it's called um, you know rugby. But ultimately, the human body doesn't really know all these rules. It just needs to develop and be really fit and work well as a machine before we can play a sport. You can develop the same cardiovascular ability via um, to play tennis via playing football. It's the same thing for the body. Similarly with golf and cricket. And in fact, now sports science is finding that it's actually essential to play multiple sports if you want to excel in any one. Um, A.B. de Villiers, one of the best batsmen in the world, one of the fittest batsmen in the world, actually is a really, really good athlete. And that is why he's such a good batsman. He's known to have played a lot of rugby, badminton, participated in swimming, track and field, and tennis. In fact, you'd be surprised to know that most Olympic athletes don't specialize before the age of 15. So when someone asks me that question about their seven-year-old, I'll be like, just first let them play. Let them play everything. Next, I get questions such as, how do I improve my tennis serve? And this is what we as sports scientists do. We take the science, we go to something like the kinetic chain theory, which says that the body exists as a series of chains. So the movement at one joint will if eventually affect the movement at, at another joint. So when you move from your ankle, it gets translated to the knee, the movement at the knee affects the movement at the hip, and like that. So to get a really good tennis serve, the ideal, the maximum amount of power you can generate is 4,000 watts of power. So that is the same amount of energy that you would require to climb up 12 flights of stairs in two seconds. That's the kind of power we're talking. Now, you cannot develop that just from your shoulder and a flick of the wrist. There's obviously more to that story, and in that gray area is where science comes in. How we would explain this to an athlete is that most of your force is generated from the ground, and then, in fact, 50%, if you look at that graph, is generated from the ground, and that force from the ground is translated into your body through all of your joints and eventually into the swing. So when I'm advising on technique, this is kind of how you would apply sports science to improve a technique in, say, a tennis serve. This is another key question, which is a constant debate, which is the best body type for health and for sports? Well, the answer, like everything else in sports science, is that, well, it depends. This person here is a sprinter, and this body type is that for a marathon runner. So a body type will develop based on what it has to do, based on the purpose. Marathon runners need to have, they need to be lighter, they need to run for longer, they're burning fats for energy. Whereas a sprinter who's only running maybe a few seconds is using immediate energy which is stored in the muscles. So that's why they have huge muscles, so they can store all that energy and use it when they need. Now, a sprinter is probably gonna be a worse marathon runner than me. 
because I am somewhere in the middle. I'm a normal human being and I can kind of work both my systems. But when you're talking about sports, you're not talking about normal health. You're talking about the extremes in one way or another. Whose athletes are people whose body types have specialized to an extreme in one direction. For example, if you look at water polo, the, all water polo players, generally, it would be advantageous to them to have a really long forearm to arm ratio so they can throw the ball further. I mean, NBA, one in 10 men are seven feet tall, whereas the average male height is 5'10 in the rest of the population. The average height of the elite uh, female gymnast, to be a gymnast, you want to be tiny, you want to be able to roll in the air, you want to be able to spin. So those body types come to an advantage when you are specializing in a particular sport. In fact, my favorite example is that of Phelps, who's just apparently touted as a genetic freak of nature, somebody who's created for, to swim. He just happens to have every genetic advantage that helps him in the water. For example, most people have a wingspan that is the same as their height. That's kind of how we are. But Phelps, who's 6'4", has a wingspan of 6'7". That allows him to move his arms further in water and gives him a competition over the next person, an, a, I mean, an advantage over the next person. Similarly, his shoe size is much bigger than the average shoe size, allowing him to have natural flippers. His chest is double jointed, which allows him to get more flexibility in the water and to move faster. I mean, there are multiple. This is only a list of some that he has. He just naturally produces less lactate, gets less tired. So I'm just telling you this as certain examples of the kind of things that we look at in sports science. And he has won 28 gold medals. He's probably the most celebrated, most successful swimmers of all time at the Olympic level. So it encourages us or it makes it easier for us to feel that, look, there's a formula. He has these things. So should we look for people with long arms or should we look for people with bigger legs? Is that going to translate into Olympic gold medals? And that's kind of where sports science was when I studied it, that the human body it is basically just a blend of biology, psychology, nutritional science, biochemistry, multiple fields, but ultimately we're looking to see how can we create a better human. And that's why the way I view it and interpret it is, well, working at the edge of human ability. You know, if Bolt is running at 9.7 in a sprint, how do we get him to 9.6? How do we work at that edge and how do we make it better? And what are the rules? And that gives us two gives us a lot of insight into how the human body works and how it functions. Generally, sports science is, in summary, this slide. We, you, we view the body as a sum of its parts. Okay, what's happening at the DNA level? Are we, you know, the genetic code is coding for proteins, enzymes, and that is translating into certain um, physiological, you know, outcome of the body, and that helps them in exercise. We look at heart rate, we look at systems of the body, how they interact, and it's, it's actually really cool as a subject. But now I'm more than a sports scientist in terms that I just view myself as a scientist and someone who's very interested in the human body and how it works. Sports science is one way to view it, and generally we view it as, like I showed you, the sum of its parts, this is what's happening, this is the formula, this is how the human body works, let's just add it up, and if you put this input, you're gonna get another output. In the 80s, um, scientists tried to recreate breast milk. They took um, the breast milk, they created a formula, and they said that, look, if a child is unable to be breastfed by the mother, let us create something where we can just give. So they took the milk, they measured it in the lab, made an, you know, a, a scientific version of it, and started selling this formula. Years later, scientists have realized that the kids who were on the formula started getting more ill than the kids who were on breast milk. And then they reopened that chapter, looked into it, and now they found something really interesting. They have discovered that it is not just what's in the milk. It is the communication between the mother and child during breastfeeding, such that if the child is lacking in a particular nutrient, if the child is picking up a particular illness, the mother's body reacts to that and creates certain proteins that the child needs, creates the enzymes, and gives it to the child through the breast milk. I mean, that's a beautiful thought. You can't formula that. You know, you cannot recreate that. And that is kind of what I'm starting to see more and more of these kind of trends in the human body. Cardiovascular disease, one of the biggest killers. People are saying, oh, it's lack of exercise. It's, you know, you're eating wrong. It's cholesterol, this, that. I've read a study recently that says that owning a pet, owning a dog can reduce your risk of cardiovascular disease. And literally by just 
petting a dog for a few days a week, people have lowered their blood pressure, lowered their heart rate, they've even reduced cholesterol levels. I mean, that's a great excuse for kids who want to pick up a pet and their parents are saying, no, you can just have them check the science on that. And here's another one that I love because I did neuroscience before I did sports science. So earlier it was believed that the brain forms from the age of zero to 18 and then it's just formed and that your brain is now who you are and everything you do is now set in stone. And that's why we attributed everything to our personality and you know, whatever you, this is your nature, this is your personality, this, these are your preferences. Well, there's a concept called neuroplasticity, which now looks at the brain as something that rewires itself every single day. Every part of your brain is changing every single day and it's changing based on what you eat, what exercise you do, who you talk to. After this TED talk, your brain is gonna go back and rewire itself. That is how quickly your brain is changing. So there's no formula for that. You cannot formula it. There are multiple, multiple, multiple experiences and inputs that we are having and reacting to on a daily basis. Even if you take a science that seems as sure of itself as genetics, which is we have a lot of people in science who think that, oh, it's all in the genes and everything's written and it's all predetermined, which is kind of true. The genetics is the script of what your cells will do, how they will express themselves. Genetics is ultimately your, you know, it's like the, it's, it's literally the script of your life. But now here's an interesting science that's come up called epigenetics, which looks at which genes are turned on and off based on your experiences. So I might have the genes for certain things. I might have the genes for obesity. I might have the genes for, you know, certain diseases. I might have the genes for whatever I may, I may need the genes for, but whether they be turned on or off is based on my experiences, is based on my choices that I make, it's based on the input I make. We, haven't, we will never be able to formula that. So the code is there. Well, we are more like directors in our lives for this script. The script is written, but the way we direct it, our input, our interactions, our experiences, have a much larger impact than we previously thought. And this is science saying this. This is not something mystical. This is not some, you know, tap into your magic kind of thing. This is pure science. So instead of viewing the body as just like a pure machine that you can kind of, some of its parts tweak, you give this input and we get a certain output, I feel that we have programs that we have understood this. We've understood it quite well. But, and I view that as something that we have which is the best medicine in the world. We have fantastic knowledge about the body. We have the science. We understand different systems so well. There is volumes of information out there and so much research going on in the body. But you can have the best medicine in the world. Assuming this pill has the best medicine in the world for say, I don't know, cancer. I can guarantee you that if you take this medicine, you will cure cancer or you can cure diabetes or you can cure whatever. But if the capsule that that medicine is delivered in is not something that is received by the human being, if the human body is unable to digest that medicine, it is completely useless. So my parallel is this. I've been working in science for a long time. I've studied it. And I find that we, are, we have such fantastic, brilliant knowledge, but we're not delivering it to people so they are able to make sense of it. We're not delivering it in context, we're not delivering it to human beings, we're just creating this amazing knowledge which gets created in universities and it gets created you know, through research, it goes through so much time before it actually reaches people and changes their lives. That lag between creating researching something, getting it published, teaching it in a university, a student going to study it, coming back home and applying it could 